I want to start off today by reading uh, a couple of entries that uh, is found in this concise dictionary of the Christian tradition. If you want a, a book that gives you just a very brief definition of all kinds of terms, the terms that you will hear in various churches, or if you're reading uh, commentaries and theology books and so on, and you run across so many of these terms, you, well, what does that mean? What does this mean? Uh, how does this tradition differ from that tradition? Well, this is a good source because you have all of the stuff here, very concise definitions. So I want to look at the definition here of original sin. And there actually there are many different ideas or several different ideas about original sin, but we'll take a look at that today. And let me just re begin by reading this definition from this concise dictionary of the Christian tradition. And here's, here's uh, what it says. It says, A sinful condition common to every member of the human race since the sin of Adam. It is contrasted with actual sin, which is self-conscious rejection of God's will. There are different theories concerning the nature of original sin. Number one, some hold that when Adam sinned, he sinned as the federal head of the human race, and therefore all sinned in him. In other words, what that means is that since Adam was the federal head of all of us, the entire human race, then when he sinned, sorry, you sinned. I sinned. We all sinned. And so we're all guilty. We're born guilty, born bearing Adam's guilt. That's what basically it means. <clears throat> thus, it says, goes on to say, thus all are guilty of his sin and all are born as sinners. That it means to, out of fellowship with God. Number two, others accept that all are born with a sinful heart, but reject the idea of guilt for the sin of another. Here is original sin. In a, a, here, original sin is a bias toward evil. So in other words, yeah, it affected all of us, the fall of Adam. Uh, it changed the human heart. Now we have this proclivity to sin, but we're not bearing Adam's guilt. We start bearing guilt when we commit personal sins. So that makes a little more sense than the idea that we're guilty because of what Adam did. When we didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't take the forbidden fruit. Number three, when the historicity of Adam is denied, original sin is, in other words, when people deny that the story in Genesis is true, they say there wasn't really an Adam, that that's just a metaphor for something else. Uh, so when the historicity of Adam is denied, original sin becomes a way of expressing the fact of corporate sin, failure, and evil in the human race. <clears throat> Many hold that original sin is forgiven at baptism and then its effects are removed through regeneration and sanctification. Roman Catholics hold that Mary, mother of Jesus, was prevented or preserved from original sin. So what is that latter one about? Uh, you've heard of the Immaculate Conception. A lot of people hear the expression the Immaculate Conception and they think that's talking about the conception, the miraculous conception of Jesus Christ. It's not. It's talking about the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary, because the idea is that Christ wanted to, the, the nature, the human nature he was born with had to be a perfect human nature. So then Mary herself, his mother, had to be preserved from original sin. In other words, she couldn't be born uh, or be conceived bearing this stain of original sin, however you wish to define that, upon her soul. Otherwise, then she would be like any other human being and Christ would have the same nature. But Christ needed to have that perfected nature. So Mary was by singular act of grace, the way the Catholics put it, then she was preserved from or prevented from ever having that stain of original sin. When I first heard that, I thought, well, why didn't God just do everybody that way? <laughs> been a good idea. It been prevented a whole lot of sin in the world, I guess. But anyway, that's the idea. Now, if you ask the Orthodox, uh, well, you know, they have their succession of bishops going all the way back too. But if you ask them, what do they think about the Catholic version, the, the Catholic view of original sin and the Immaculate Conception of Mary, they'd say it's nonsense. We don't understand it. 
Uh, it, 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 they don't even get it. Uh, what's, what's the point here? They speak of ancestral sin. They do believe that the sin of Adam affected all humankind in some way, but they don't believe in this idea of somehow the soul is stained by original sin and that and that's transferred from generation to generation uh, in that way. So to them, it's, uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's just, uh, you know, what is that about? They don't understand it. And then you have in the Reformed tradition, some of them or many of them are strictly Augustinian and they look upon original sin as that whatever, that, that, that not only a proclivity to sin, but also believe, some of them at least, believe that human beings are born bearing the guilt of Adam. So when, uh, uh, when God sends people to hell who never heard the truth, never had the gospel, even if he sends little children who are not elect to hell, you say, you mean they deserve that? And I say, yeah, yeah. Why? Because of what the federal head did, what Adam did. So there you have all these ideas about original sin. Now, I basically reject most of that, most of what I said, but I am comfortable with and do believe it's biblical to say that there is a form of original sin, or at least one that I can accept as biblical and as true, and that is that the fall did affect humankind because, because it changed the relationship with God. The human being was designed and made, and God said when he made man, he was very good. What he, he looked at his creation and said, this is very good. He made man in his image and after his likeness, and that, does not, that, that means it can't be flawed. In other words, it's good, and in some way bears the image and likeness of God himself, and therefore it cannot be bad. And the idea is, though, that when Adam, and everybody agrees, that Adam had free will, he had free choice, he had the ability to make the wrong choice, as well as to make the right choice. He could have obeyed God completely and fully, but he made the wrong choice. So everybody is in agreement on that, that Adam had free will. But once Adam exercised his free will and made the wrong choice, then that ended free will. That's the idea that some have. I, I don't agree with that at all. What I would agree with, though, is that the condition that came about as a result of Adam violating God's law and affecting all of us, the condition that came about is that we no longer have access to God the way Adam did originally. Human, I'm talking about we, I say we, I'm talking about humankind in general. So man has been basically cut off from God and man was designed, being in the image and after the likeness of God, to be in communion with God. So when communion is broken, then there's something missing. And when you have something missing, then inevitably human beings will fall into sin. But that doesn't mean now, though, that they no longer have a freedom of will, that they can't help but just make the wrong choice all the time. It doesn't mean that when they are presented with the truth, that they cannot receive it, accept it, embrace it, and have faith in it. Doesn't mean that. Now, the Calvinist would say it does mean that. The Calvinist would say that faith itself is a gift. In fact, here's the way the Calvinist understands the Augustinian. That would include many Lutherans and others. But the Augustinian, and this, that's the guy who introduced all this stuff to the Christian world. All this stuff about inherited guilt and all of that. And about uh, this uh, rad kind of a radical view of human depravity or inability. And the denial of free will. It was he, he is the one who, who introduced that. But the, the Calvinist would have you believe that we're all born dead in sins. Born that way. We're spiritual stillborns. And that none of us are capable of responding to the gospel positively. In other words, you cannot exercise faith in the, once you hear the truth, even if you understand the truth, you cannot, you cannot accept it. You cannot come to God in faith a faith that saves, unless, unless he has awakened you from this state of death, just as Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. In fact, that analogy is very often used. Said, Lazarus did not have any, he did not cooperate in his own resurrection. And of course he didn't. He was lying there dead. He was dead as a doornail, as they say. 
And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And he awakened. Lazarus didn't say, well, I've got to agree to it first. No, Lazarus awakened from the state of death. He came out of the tomb. And so many would say that that's exactly the way salvation works. You cannot receive it. You cannot be saved. You cannot have faith unless God first regenerates you. That is to say, he awakens you from spiritual death. Well, I don't find that in the Bible. I do find the Bible saying that man is dead in his sins. But I also see that there are other metaphors that are used to describe the human condition. And when the, the, human, the uh, human condition is described, the writer is looking at human history, looking at humankind in general, Jews and Gentiles alike. And he describes them, yes, as being dead in their sins. He also describes them as being, remember what Jesus said, the sick need a physician. Now, the sick, you know, these, you, you want to use the one metaphor. So, well, the dead can't make any choices. Dead can't choose uh, what is right. Can't choose to be saved, receive salvation. You have to be resurrected before you can do that. And so that's, but if you use only that one metaphor, yeah, you can make the case. It's like one Calvinist I was listening to was giving a sermon and talking about how many talk about throwing a lifeline to the sinner as if the sinner's out there bobbing up and down in the ocean. He's lost and here comes a ship and someone comes along and throws a lifeline. Now it's your responsibility to grab it. He said, and this Calvinist says, the dead can't grab anything. So you have to be, first of all, have to be resurrected from the dead before you can grab the lifeline. That's the idea. But, uh, but others would have, certainly have a radically different uh, understanding of that. And my understanding of it is very different from that because biblical metaphors are many. For example, uh, human beings are described as being uh, enslaved to sin. They're described as being in jail or in, in prison, imprisoned to sin, shackled to sin, and uh, so forth. And as I said, sick. The, the, the uh, sick need a physician, Jesus said. So you have these different metaphors for describing the sinful condition, but if you focus on the one, you could take, you could run anywhere you want to with it. And that's what the Augustinians or Calvinists have done uh, in their view of original sin. But the one, the one view that I am familiar, that I am comfortable with, and that is that human beings were made to be in communion of, with God, and when that communion is broken, then we are limited, very limited, but, but, that does not mean we don't still have free will. It does not mean that we're not therefore still accountable before God. And I'm talking to whoever you are, you're still accountable because there is a sense of right and wrong, whoever you are. And those who have the scriptures have a heightened sense of right and wrong because you have the revelation of God. Therefore, you have a greater accountability before God. Well, I'd like to go back and, and at the beginning of the story and take a look at how it all unfolds from Genesis onward. And we'll go right to the last day of creation, the sixth day of creation, uh, when God determined that he would make man and put him on the earth. Obviously, man is the pinnacle of his creation because he's going to bear the image and likeness of God. And this is what this fir the first several days of creation is all about, preparing this place for the arrival of this creature who would bear God's image and also be God's co-regent over the creation. Verse 26, chapter 1 of Genesis, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He's going to be different from everything else God has created. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and so forth. So you know the rest of the story there. He placed man in the Garden of Eden. He gave him a special place and told him to keep and attend a garden. You see that uh, what is called sometimes called the uh, the second creation account. I don't consider it a second creation account in chapter two. I consider it a uh, the, the chapter two to be focusing on some of the details that are merely summarized in chapter one. So in this chapter two, you see that God, uh, you see the origin of the woman, the origin of marriage, and you see the origin of the Garden of Eden. 
So he gives man this special, special place to stay. I want you to keep in mind throughout this, uh, I want you to think Israel. You, I want you to see the patterns are the same. You see the patterns that occur here are the same that happened in Israel. God gave the people of Israel, gave Abraham and his seed, a special place for them to dwell, didn't he? And he put them in, he brought them into that place. He said, in effect, dress it and keep it. In other words, you, you know, obey me, be faithful to my covenant. I've given you the rules, you abide by the rules. God puts Adam in this special place. It's all designed for him. He says, abide by the rules and you can prosper here. You can do well here. If not, you're going to be driven out. Well, in the day that you do, you will die. In other words, you'll be a dead man walking because you will no longer have access to the tree of life. You'll be driven out of the land. And of course, that's what ultimately happened. So you see the parallel. You see the similarity between the story of Israel and the story of Adam. He was given a special place, a special land. Uh, he was told to, to obey the law that God had given him. And then when he did not, he was driven out of that land. Same thing happened to Israel later on. So you see these parallels, and it's, I think it's obvious, it's obvious that this is deliberate. The parallel is deliberate. And so you see, you see this going on. Let's just move on uh, a little further into text here. It says, uh, let's get on over to the fall now. That's what we're really talking about, what happened when Adam uh, did make the wrong, Adam and Eve, they both made the wrong choice. It says, now the serpent, chapter 3, verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did not, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Uh, but then, of course, the serpent said, you will not die. And you know the rest of the story there. It ends up that they did eat of the fruit of the, of the tree that God said you shall not eat of. And uh, then you read, as you read through the chapter there, you see what God said, the curse. You see Adam and Eve were driven out of the land. And, the, the, of course, the curse that he pronounced on the serpent as well. Well, let's skip over all of that and get over to chapter 4. We see the aftermath now. Now that they're out of the land, that is to say, out of the Garden of Eden, the cherubim were placed there. As it says uh, in verse 24 of chapter 3, he drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So this, this reminds you of something else, doesn't it? You think of the cherubim. Uh, where were images of the, play of the cherubim placed in the temple or in the tabernacle. It was over the mercy seat, right? And this is the place where God himself appeared. So this is something that's reminiscent of that. It reminds you of that at, at the very least. And then uh, it goes on to talk about uh, Adam and Eve, and it, and it focuses on just specific sons of theirs, and not everyone, because we're told that they had sons and daughters. No doubt, as long as they lived you know, longer than 60 or 70 or 80 years, they lived such a long time, they must have had many, many, many sons and daughters, but it focuses on only a couple of them here. And as begin with, it's Cain and Abel. It says, now Adam knew his wife, she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man from, with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, or literally in the Hebrew, in the end of days. Now, it's interesting, this terminology, because it could mean, as some commentators have pointed out, it could mean, what were those days? What were those days? It could mean at the end of the days of the week. In other words, this happened on a Sabbath day, the seventh day. In the course of time, or in the end of days, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. So he, how, do you bring, how do you bring an offering to the Lord? You got to know where the Lord is, don't you? If he's going to bring it to the Lord, there must have been a particular place. Could it have been there at the entrance, the east entrance of the Garden of Eden? Between the cherubim? Could that be the place that God appeared and communicated with them? Just, just throwing that, that out as a possibility because it does run parallel with what you see uh, in the time of the tabernacle in Israel. 
It says, and now Abel, was, now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought, or at the end of the days, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. So God is here communicating with them, isn't he? He had regard for Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So it's not, it's not as if that they're completely cut off from God and have no association with him, no ac access to him, is it? So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? Now, I, I want to ask you this, what he's about to say here. Does this sound like that Cain was unable at this point to respond positively to the divine commands. Was he unable by his actions to please God? Now that's what some would have you believe. <coughs> Said that no one seeks God, that God seeks us, but no, we don't seek God if we're in this fallen state. But I want you to look at Cain here. He's obviously, he, he's a flawed individual. You know this by the kind of offering he brought, the, the wrong offering. It says, why are you angry and why is your face? If you do well, what is the implication here? The implication is that you could do well. You have the capability of doing well. If you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, will I not accept you just as I have accepted Abel? And the answer, the, you know, the answer obviously is yes. So that's what he's telling Cain. He's telling Cain, that I can, you can have a right relationship with me by simply conforming to what I tell you here. If you do well, you will also be accepted just like your brother's accepted. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. He's personifying sin here as if it were something that could hide behind the door and spring on you. Because that's kind of the way it happens sometimes. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Now, if I were a Calvinist, I'd say, yeah, but you can't do that. You can't do that because you are, you are totally depraved. That means you're totally unable. You, you've been so disabled that you cannot but sin. You can't do what's right. But no, he says you must rule over it. So the implication here is very clear in my mind is that Cain could have ruled over sin. He could have restored the right relationship with God. But, of course, you know the story. He didn't. He killed Abel. We won't read through all of that. And then you have, notice again, as I said earlier, that only a couple of sons are focused on, even though Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. And their sons and daughters had many sons and daughters, but it only focuses on two lines here. One is the line of Cain. Remember, Cain, Cain in this account is the bad guy. And you see his children apparently behaving somewhat as he did. You see that in the example of Lamech. Let's just break right into the text here. Verse 23, Lamech says to, said to his wives, now here you have plural marriages. You know, Adam, Adam only had the one wife. God gave him only the one wife, Eve. But here now you have Lamech takes two wives. This might be the origin of polygamy. <clears throat> says, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me. Sounds, like, sounds a little bit like his dad, doesn't it? Same characteristic. A young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. In other words, what this is telling us is Cain's violence, his violence is now being magnified in his offspring. And this is not a genetic thing, it does, because look, Cain and Abel came from the same source. And no, don't think that the, the serpent in the garden was really a, a you know, manifestation of some kind of physical being that, that uh, fathered Cain. That's just nonsense. No, Cain and Abel are the children of Adam and Eve. And so Cain kills Abel, and now you see in the line of Cain, Cain's violence, the kind of violence manifested in the life of Cain is being magnified now in his children. It tells you 
it, again, it's, a, it's not a genetic thing. It's a learned behavior. It says Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. Now, this is interesting what it says about this. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. Now, they had plenty of other offspring. Well, why focus on this one? Because this one is going to take the place of Abel for a very particular reason. Remember, Abel was the good guy. He brought the correct offering. Cain is the bad guy in the, in the narrative. And here we see someone who now is born to Adam and Eve, and his name is Seth, and he is a replacement for Abel. So Seth also, also a son was born. Uh, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that, at that time, now as these, the line of Seth began to multiply, at that time, people, meaning these people, right here, this being described in this text, began to call upon the name of the Lord. Actually, in the Hebrew, they began to call themselves by the name of the Lord. You know what that means? They weren't saying, I'm the Lord. You know, we're, we're the Lord. No, they, they were called, they were named, they named the name of the Lord upon themselves, meaning they, this line, these group of people, this family, were in covenant relationship with God, unlike the line of Cain. That's the point that's being made here. So they begin to call themselves by the name of God. Now, again, I want you to keep, uh, as we go through this, keep Israel in mind. And what happened to Israel? But uh, we'll continue on here. Read part of, we'll read part of chapter 5 here, and then I want to skip over to chapter 6. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and blessed them, them and named them man, or Adam, when they were created. When Adam was, had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. Same guy here. Now notice what it says. Adam made after the image and likeness of God. Now he has a son after the image and likeness of Adam. There's a message in this, isn't it? It's not that the other sons didn't have the same image and likeness. But here he's singling out Seth for a very special reason. Because this line is in covenant relationship with God. The days of Adam, after Adam had fathered Seth, were 800 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Adam lived, that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So he must have had a whole slew of sons and daughters. But then again, these are singled out. And then it talks about the lion of Seth. And of course, the, uh, the point here is to lead us to the birth of Noah. The birth of Noah. But something else happens in the meantime. Something else happens. Remember, you have the line of Cain and you see Cain's violence magnified in Lamech, particularly, but in his line. And then you see uh, Enoch, or, or Seth replacing Abel and his people, his family, are in covenant relationship with God. So you have these two very different lines coming out of the same family. And then chapter 6, we come to chapter 6. It says, when men or when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters born to them, I want you to think Israel again. Think about Israel as we read through this. And I think it gives, sheds some light on what it's actually talking about. It says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took of their wives any they chose. Now, that's what men had been doing all along. However, this is somewhat, there's something different here. It says they took of wives, their wives, for their wives, any that they chose. So what do you have? What, what's being described here? The line of Seth, the line in covenant relationship with God, now taking wives from any they chose, that would mean also from the line of Cain. From the line of Cain. And what, uh, it, it, these are two very different lines, aren't they? Again, I say, think of Israel. What happened when they approached Moab and when the king of Moab hired Balaam to come and curse the people of Israel? Well, God wouldn't let him do that. So what he did, he came and pronounced blessings over them. And the king said, what are you doing? Balak said, what are you doing? 
You're, you're blessing them. I hired you to come and curse them. He said, I can't do except what God allows me to do. Blessing upon you, O Israel. <laughs> so he couldn't only, do, that's all he could do. And uh, so, but he figured out a way to get the job done anyway. Do you know what it was? Remember the story? He had Balak use the women of Moab to do what? To lead the idiot men, <laughs> lead these men into idolatry. And thus then God himself cursed them. You see something similar going on here? When the sons of Seth, the people in covenant relationship with God, began to marry the daughters of men of all that they chose. And we're not talking about angels. I'll tell you why I don't believe this is angels marrying, marrying women. It says that sons of God. Who? First of all, Adam in the New Testament is called the son of God. Seth has Adam's image and likeness. He's a son of God, isn't he? Israel is called the Son of God, collectively called the Son of God in Scripture. And remember what it says about the descendants of Israel when they went into rebellion. And he says that uh, they'll, they're not my people. And he said in the same place where it was said of them, they're not my people. There it shall be said of them, they are the sons or the children of the living God. So Israelites were the children of God, the sons of God. The sons of God here, why should I think, just because angels are also called sons of God, that these were angels, fallen angels, that are manifested themselves in, in human form and then having these children? And that was the problem. Well, you see, you see that all over the place. That's the idea that's out there. It's in the book of Enoch, something like that. But the reason I reject it is because the story flow in the story here, the sons of God would be the descendants of Seth, the godly line of Seth, who are in covenant relationship with God. And this runs parallel with what went on in Israel later on. So the sons of God, like the sons of God in the time of Israel, the nation of Israel, began to be attracted to the practices of other countries, other nations, and sometimes that involved the women in these other countries used to draw them into these things. At least on one occasion we know that was the case. And you see the same thing here. They began to intermarry with these the people known for their violence, as you see, and things began to kind of go downhill from there. Rather than the sons of God being an influence upon them, the daughters of men, it seems that the other way took place. Now something else was going on here. And furthermore, if these, if these were angels, and supposedly they gave birth to these Nephilim or giants. And if you get on the internet, you see all kinds of ideas floating around there about how they were, this was a mixed species. Now, why would that be so? And I never quite understood that. Why would it be mixed? Because these angels supposedly were manifested as human beings. They had human physiology. That means they would have had human DNA, doesn't it? So why, wouldn't that not, why would that not simply give birth to humans? That, that makes no sense. Do angels have DNA? DNA is a physical thing after all. Angels are spirit beings. And if they manifested themselves as human beings, then they would have human DNA. So why would you have these, muta these big mutants, X-Men, running around all over the place? No, that's not what's happening here. Let's read what it actually says. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. It's not talking about lifespan. It's talking about how much longer it will be before the flood. The Nephilim, it says. The Nephilim. Now here's, here's problem number two. It exacerbates what was going on there. The Nephilim, translated giants in some translations, were on the earth in those days. Also afterward. No, wait a minute. In what days? When were they on the earth? Well, when the sons of daughter came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. In other words, in the days that that was going on, the Nephilim were already there. It doesn't say that they were born to them. It says they were there. And then they would be there later. And you find it, sure enough, in the time of ancient Israel, you find Nephilim in the land. Giants. And what that means is warriors. Warriors. 
And if you have rule, warriors ruling over tribes, then you're going to, and, and at the same time you have this escalation of violence, then you, you've got a big, a really bad situation there. So this is not about species mixing. This is about human beings becoming more and more violent. And so these Nephilim, these giants, they were there when the sons of God began marrying with the daughters of men. It says these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. They were already known by the time this happens, by the time the sons of God and the, get together with the daughters of men. And it goes on to say, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, if it is true that if, if total depravity, the doctrine of total depravity or total inability is true, and that means that man cannot help but sin, uh, it doesn't mean that man is, that a human being is necessarily as sinful as he could become, but total depravity means simply that the entire human, uh, human being, each human being is entirely affected. That is body, mind, you know, intellect, uh, emotions, spirit, soul, anything you can call uh, an aspect of the human person is completely affected. And it means he is totally enabled now to respond to God's call to repentance until God changes him. Now, if that were the case, if that were the case, why would God express regret here? Let's read it. Let's see what it says. It says, the Lord saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth. I'll read this again. And every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Why would he be grieved to the heart if, he had, if, if man couldn't help himself? In other words, if human beings couldn't make a different choice than the choice they were making here, why would God be grieved? Wouldn't he know all along is going to happen? Furthermore, furthermore, if you go as the Calvinist route, uh, you'd have to say, well, this was in the divine decree from all eternity anyway. That God decreed it to be that way. From eternity. So he knew all along this was going to happen. Why would he be grieved in his heart? Well, some people, you know what, you know what the answer to that is if you adopt uh, the Augustinian or Calvinistic perspective? You have to say, well, this is just an anthropology Popathism. This is just a figurative expression. It doesn't really mean that God was actually grieved. That's what you have to come up with. Uh, but then the text itself says, and there's no other reason to say it. It doesn't have to say it was, he was grieved, but it says he was grieved. It was grieved in his heart. He was sorry that he had made man. Because it seems that man is doing something that even God himself did not necessarily expect. Now, he knew that he could do this, but he was disappointed that he did it as he was watching this unfold. And it says, and God saw the wickedness. You mean he didn't see that from eternity? Well, apparently not, but uh, the, point, the point I'm making here is the reason God is grieved is because the people were making choices that they didn't have to make. They could have made the better choice. The sons of God could have made a better choice. They, did, they could have continued in the worship of God as they had been doing. But now they're departing from it and violence is becoming rampant throughout the whole earth. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah... Thankfully, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, the reason he found favor was not because God from all eternity had elected him to have favor in his eyes. That's, what, that's, that's the typical reformed position. But no, it's because he it said we're told he was a righteous man, righteous in his generations. And this is not talking about a genetic thing. It's talking about a moral and spiritual thing. So we won't read through all of that, but this is what's going on there. Now then, having mentioned Israel, you see Israel's troubles in the land, and you might say the th same thing about them. If you have this 
this perspective of original sin that basically men are, but we've been plunged into this depth of depravity and we can't help ourselves and we will, that we are born sinners and then we will behave accordingly unless God awakens us from this spiritual death, then what does it mean when he tells Israel to wake up? And they still don't. Or what does this mean? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Some very, this, this is always, I've always found this to be a very interesting text in this regard. Here in chapter 30, he's talking about how the possibility that Israel, by becoming unfaithful to the covenant, just as Adam was unfaithful in the garden, just as apparently the sons of Seth were unfaithful in continuing in their worship of God, but if Israel in the land of promise becomes unfaithful, then he says, I will scatter you among the nations. I'll drive you out of the land. You see, again, the same pattern there. In chapter 30, let's start in verse 6. Well, verse 5, and, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed. This, this first of all, I didn't mention, if they're, if they're cast out, utterly cast out, and they're in these other lands, if they realize the error that they've made, if they come to their senses and they repent and they return to God, now why would he say that if it was impossible for them to do that? Well, it's not, obviously not. But if you will do that, this is what will happen. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and that you may live. In other words, if you will repent and return to God, I will restore you completely and fully to the point that you will come to what, you know, the physical act of circumcision symbolized all along, what God really wanted. He wanted circumcision of the heart. In other words, a, a heart of faithfulness and obedience. So this is what he will do for them. And it says, uh, it goes on, uh, let's skip on over to, uh, to the end. Well, let's skip on over to verse 11. Having told them that he would restore them, and once they returned to him, once they repented and began to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul, then in verse 11 says, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Have you ever heard anybody say that you can't keep the commandments? You can't keep the commandments. Nobody can keep the commandments. Is, is that what it says here? What does this mean? What does this mean when he says, this commandment that I command you today, he's talking about not just one single commandment that's real easy to keep always. He's talking about the whole law. This commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far out, far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven and bring it down to us that we may hear it and do it. In other words, it's not, it's not impossible. You know, going to heaven to get it and bring it back, that would be an impossible task. Nobody can do that. No, so he says, neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. In those days, that would have been an impossible task. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Oh, he didn't really mean that, though, did he? They couldn't do that. They can't keep the commandments because nobody can keep the commandments. They told us that in Sunday school. See, I have said before you today, life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your hearts turns away and you will not hear, but, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. So you have these two choices. And God says, I've, well, he goes on to say, I call heaven and earth, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. Could they have actually made the choice? 
Well, no, they didn't ultimately, but could they have done so? According to what he says here, yeah, they could have. They were capable of making the choice, but they didn't. You know, if, if that's not true, then I don't understand how it is that God can hold people accountable. In other words, he's put us down here. He's put us in, let us get into this condition to where we cannot make the right choice unless he intervenes and, and puts the right choice somehow, manipulates the mind and causes us to do so. But if we can't, then how does he hold us accountable? You know, I, sometimes I like to listen to Calvinist preachers. The reason I do is because that's some of the best preaching you hear anywhere. It really is. Those guys are good. Uh, they, can, they can hammer, hammer, hammer on the, the sins of the culture and all of that and do a wonderful job with it. And I'm just, I'm just though I'm just shaking my head and saying, why? Why are you doing this? Because you believe this was all set from the pre, before the foundation of the world. And here they're hammering, calling people out of sin. Say, why? They're, they're where God wants them. No, God doesn't need you to call them out of sin. He'll call whoever he wants. In fact, he's already done it. He's already chosen who he's going to have in his kingdom and who is not. So I'm thinking, why? Why can you preach so powerfully and so passionately? John MacArthur even once said, souls are at stake. I'm thinking, huh? <laughs> How can that be? How can souls be at stake if it's all settled, if settled from eternity? No, God gives people a choice. That's the point. He gives us a choice. And when he, I'm not saying that anybody can come to repentance if they don't understand what repentance is. You can't respond to truth if you don't know what truth is. But once you have truth, biblical truth, then you can, I say to you, you can naturally respond to it. And then with God's help, you are really without excuse if you don't. So I think that's the way it works. Well, I have a, there's actually much more to say, but I think we'll have to continue it in part two. Uh, I was going to go to the book of Romans, and, uh, but I'm going to leave that for another time. But I'll just summarize it briefly by saying that in the, in, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul uh, make some statements that might seem, if, if you don't study the context carefully, might seem to support this idea of a total inability and the Augustinian Calvinistic way of thinking. But in reality, when you look at it carefully, what Paul is saying over and over again and again is that there's a choice involved. He's saying that people are without excuse simply because truth has been revealed to them. And so here in the book of Romans, which is a, a favorite proof text for some Calvinists, uh, actually turns out to be just the opposite or teach just the opposite of what uh, that particular idea would, uh, would convey. I, wanna, I, wanna, I brought another book here. I'm not going to read anything out of it. I'm just going to mention it to you if you're interested in how this concept, these, some of these concepts came to be. If you go back and look at the early church fathers, you find that every one of them, to a man, in the second and third centuries, and into, even into the fourth century, when things really started to change after, you know, after the emperors started getting involved. But uh, until then, all of them taught free will. They all said that human beings have the ability to obey God. If they understand the truth, they have to have the truth. And of course, they did believe they did believe that uh, human nature was corrupted somewhat, but still, it didn't eliminate free will. They all believed that. And then come the late fourth century, the early fifth century, when a man named Augustine came on the scene. Augustine, Saint Augustine, he's known as. He's considered a saint both in the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and it's, he's said to be the father of Catholicism. He's also said to be the father of reformed theology because Calvin and Luther both were huge fans of Augustine. And Augustine then, he came along and at first, at, he, let's, let's give, let me give you some of his background. He was a Manichaean. And Manichaeanism was similar to Gnosticism in that it did believe in, it believed in fate. Everything was fated. Everything about human Humanity was corrupted. Everything was corrupted. Uh, total inability. Human beings were com completely unable to do what is right. 
So Augustine was a Manichaean, and then later he abandoned that, and he converted to Christianity. But he did so because he found a way that he could read the Christian scriptures or the, the, the Bible from a point of, the point of view of Platonism. So Greek philosophy, he was influenced by Greek philosophy to some extent by Gnosticism and by Manichaeism. All of which, all of which had this concept of total inability and of humanity, human flesh, and humanity in general being so corrupted that it couldn't do right. So that, that, that idea was very much there in place. But Augustine, when he did convert to Christianity, began to believe in and teach free will. But when Pelagius, a, a certain guy named Pelagius came on the scene, and he looked around, he went to Rome, he looked around, he saw the corruption within the church itself. He thought, what is going on here? These people are, are behaving like common heathen. They're, they're, they're supposed to be Christians. And he began to preach about human accountability and responsibility. And Augustine started listening to what he was saying or hearing about what he was saying. I don't know if it was a streak of jealousy, resentment, or whatever it was that he was getting all the attention. When Augustine, I, I get the impression he kind of liked the attention himself. But uh, anyway, that's just a, a judgment from afar. But any, in any case, he began to take issue with Pelagius. And he began to say, no, no, you're all wrong on that. A, a human being cannot respond to God's call to repentance unless he is enlivened, enabled by grace. In other words, raised from the dead, spiritually speaking. So it, Augustine at that point slipped back into his old Manichaeism and began once again, he did not the, not the religion itself, he continued to be Christian or consider himself Christian, but now he's bringing that old philosophy back in. And it's because Pelagius had come on the scene, and today, to this day, Pelagianism is considered one of those great heresies the church had to deal with long, long ago. But now, now more and more scholars are realizing that Pelagius did not preach the things that he was accused of preaching. And, you know, we have the heretic Pelagius and the great Saint Augustine. I'm not so sure that that shouldn't be reversed. Saint Pelagius and the heretic Augustine. But in any case, I wanted to mention this book here if you're interested in that sort of thing and how these things got into Christianity. Uh, these, these concepts of original sin and total depravity and all of that. Then uh, this book is entitled The Foundation of August Augustinian Calvinism. Foundation, and it's by uh, Ken Wilson. Does a very good job, and I do know as a fact because I've, I've seen, I've seen it, the response from the Calvinist camp to it, and I mean they they were they had a conniption fit when, <laughs> when they saw this book and started reading. They wanted to defend their guy Augustine, and uh, so but but there is no defense. These things are these things are so certain. This is what happened in church history, and this is how this idea uh, began to creep in. It didn't just creep in, it came in pretty quickly. And how the, what the, the church fathers in the 3rd, 4th century, 2nd, 3rd, up through the, through the 4th century were teaching, now began to get turned around. And what we have today is we have the Augustinian view being very prevalent. It's not altogether, I mean, there, there are many people who don't hold it, but it is prevalent in the world today. But the point out of all of this is, the message in all of it is, is that our understanding of human free will does not take away from the sovereignty or the greatness of God. That's what they would tell you that it does, but no, it doesn't. In fact, it tells you that human, human responsibility and accountability, the fact that you have human responsibility and accountability, and also even if human beings who do not have the law, as Paul says in Romans, the second chapter, even those who do not have the law have a certain sense of justice of what is right and what is wrong. And they're still held accountable on that, on those grounds because they have the image and likeness of God. So the point here is that human beings are held accountable. 
And a greater point for all of us is once we have biblical truth, we have this Bible, we have it in multiple translations, we can study it, we can read it, we can come together and freely have Bible studies and learn all about God from this, the accountability, I would say, is intensified. It's, it's magnified. God holds us responsible for what we know and what we do with what we know. And so therefore, it's a good thing to know. The more knowledge, the better. But remember, we are accountable for it. God holds us to it. And we must please Him. With all, and we must love Him with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our souls. And we have the assurance if we do that, then it will be well with us.